Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to have David Gonzalez as tonight's guest speaker. David was born and raised in the Bronx where he attended Cardinal Hayes High School. He earned a BA from Yale and a Masters in Journalism from Columbia University. Since arriving at the Times in 1990, he has served as the Times Bronx Bureau Chief Metro Religion Writer, About New York Columnist, and the Central America Caribbean Bureau, Bureau Chief. Most recently, he wrote uh, the bi-weekly citywide feature column, as well as having published a year-long look at the life of an undocumented family in New York City. Currently, David is co-editor of the New York Times Lens Blog, and does the bi-weekly Side Street photo essay feature for the, for the paper's metro section. In recent years, he has returned to his photographic roots as a founding member of Los Seis del Sur, a collective of New Yorican photographers who documented the South Bronx in the 1980s. Um, David Gonzalez is one of the essential voices that define and bring our city into sharper focus. And we are so honored to have him here tonight. I'm going to sit down a little bit. Actually, maybe I should stand while I, before I start showing the pictures. Thank you very much for showing up tonight. Um, it's good to see some familiar faces here, including uh, my partner in crime, Angel Franco, who's also an alum of SBA, I believe. And, um, and um, we worked on a lot of great stories together. This is before I picked up the camera. He, he had the cameras. And uh, the, the undocumented story that we did that was with Angel, the Pentecostal storefront story that we spent a year with the congregation. Franco was my man on that. And we got into a lot of trouble and a lot of fun while we were doing that. Um, but like Jaime said, I, you know, I, I stumbled back into photography. I, um, I started out, um, I went off to college thinking I was going to be a doctor. And uh, something happened along the way. And I decided I didn't want to be a doctor. Didn't know what I wanted to do, and while I was casting about, uh, my roommate was into photography. And after dinner one day, we went to the dark room, and I was like, oh, it's chemistry. I know chemistry. I was a science nerd. And so, yeah, it's chemistry. I could do that. And so I, I, I got into it, and I realized that I really liked it a lot, because I found I could say things that I, I really couldn't express with words at all, and I could get at you know, all these complicated feelings in my head. And, you know, my work in, in that period was divided between photographs that I took just walking around the streets in New Haven, um, a lot of radical political stuff with uh, the Puerto Rican student group, Despelta Boricua de Pinero Tuyo, and, um, and then when I come back to the Bronx, I just take pictures of the neighborhood where we lived or wherever I went, and um, I did that very seriously, and even though I got a degree in psychology, um, I did study some photography at Yale, took a couple of essential courses, and I also met one of my early mentors, Juan Fuentes, who ran a newspaper in Hartford called El Observador. It was a Puerto Rican community newspaper. And I was primarily a self-taught photographer in those days, and as much as I knew chemistry, I didn't know photography. <laughs> um, and so I taught myself a lot of really bad habits. And, and Juan Fuentes was the first person to look at my portfolio, such as it was, and do two things, say, you're onto something, why don't you work with me? And two, you gotta learn technique. <laughs> you have to learn technique. So this crazy Quixote of a man you know, had me go to his house in Hartford for a week and just, you know, like boot camp in the dark room, left and right, printing and reprinting and reprinting and, and talking about stuff. And one of the biggest lessons I learned from Juan actually had nothing to do with film or paper or the dark room. We were leaving the dark room, which was at the, the San Juan Center on Park Street in Hartford, if you know it, and um, <laughs> the cops were hassling, these two cops were hassling a guy in the lot next to the, the center, and so Juan looks at them, looks at me, and says, here, take, take the camera, take pictures, so he gives me one of his Nikon Fs, and I'm like, pero Juan, no, there's no film, says, take pictures, Juan, there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no, take pictures, so I take the camera up, empty, no film, take pictures, and the cops leave the guy alone. I thought, that's interesting, <laughs> you know? Is there a cause and effect there? But that, that was a very interesting revelation for me, was the power that this, that you're watching, that you're taking notes, as Mike Weiner says. Um, and with the camera, it really appealed to me. So I, you know, I, I left Yale and went to work at a small community arts group called Enfocal, 
which then was a Latino photographer's group, and uh, you know did everything we had to do. You know, exhibits on the street, exhibits in banks, libraries, uh, exhibits at the Museo del Barrio. Back when the Museo del Barrio actually showed social documentary photography, I'm talking about you know the early '80s at this point. Um, and I also had 24-hour access to a professional darkroom, which is really the reason I took this job. They paid $110 a week because I lived three blocks away and had access to a full darkroom, which was really good. Um, and then things happened at home and I had to get a real job, so I kind of forgot about photography in the early 80s. Um, but I drifted back. I drifted back in, uh, when I went overseas for the paper. Because back then they used to pay uh, foreign correspondents that they used your pictures. And so I said, well, I can take pictures. And I paid for my camera within you know, two months. Um, and I started taking pictures again, but it was really hard. You know, it's two different parts of the brain. And so you're recording and you're taking down notes and then you put down that and you pick up the camera. And in some countries you say, I'm gonna take pictures. And then everybody just stands like this looking at you. I got lots of pictures in all of Central America of people just standing like this. Um, so <laughs> that was a challenge. But what happened was, you know, slowly I started getting back into my, into my photography through that. And the really big moment for me, the, the, the shift for me, was in 2009 when I got a scanner and I hauled out all my old negatives and I started scanning stuff. And that was really instructive. It was like a time machine. Um, emotionally, I felt like I was back in the moment, at least those that I could remember. I was a little wild back in those days. Um, but... I started seeing things. And the, the benefit of looking at old work when you have some experience is that you look at it with very different eyes. And like the stuff that you liked when you were a kid, you, you say, I must have been high <laughs> to like that because that don't look good. And then the stuff that you, you pass by, you're like, damn, I, why didn't you see this picture before? And there's one, the picture that I'm best known for is, is one of those where it stayed in a you know, contact sheet for 30 years, unseen by me, until I scanned it. And what happened was I started scanning, and then my editor at the time, Joe Sexton, suggested I do a cover story for the Metropolitan section uh, based around these black and white images of the South Bronx primarily. And I wrote an essay for it. Now, I've worked on a lot of really big projects at the paper, some really high-profile stuff. Nothing that I did at the paper in my entire career equaled the reaction I got to those photographs in that essay. About, and it was basically about how I graduated. I went off to Yale to become a doctor, and instead I came back as a long-haired photographer. Uh, being that I was one of the few people in my family to ever go to college, my folks were mortified by, by the fact. My, I think they would rather I'd been a musician. My father was an amateur musician, so he was cool with that. But a photo I mean, you know, listen, the communities that we came from, the photographer, as Franco knows, the photographer is the guy that takes communion pictures. You know, it's the guy that, you know, you go there and you, know, you kneel down and you go like this and you have Jesus hovering over you in the background and, you know, you look like an innocent uncle. That's what they thought was photography. And about maybe eight months before my father died, I actually sat down with him and pu pulled out the books that influenced me. And so I pulled out the Walker Evans, I pulled out the Friedlander, I pulled out the Winogram, and I said, this is photography. This is what I want to do, said he, who <laughs> had very little experience. But I think my father got an inkling of it, that what I was trying to do was not be the guy in the corner, you know, corner photo studio, but to do something a little different. And I don't think they, he ever quite got it, to be honest. He passed away about eight months after that in March. Um, but those images of that time and that essay sparked a lot of interest in that. And what happened was the paper asked me to start doing photographs with some of my columns, first online and then in print. And that's eventually how um, the City Room uh, blog turned into Side Street, which is what I do now. Uh, every other week. And it's basically, you know, a black and white picture with a 750 word column. Um, I've taken two color pictures, and I've done like 80 of them now, maybe, maybe a few more. But I've taken only two color pictures. One was I was doing, I was doing a piece on graffiti, and I figured that's kind of stupid to have this really beautiful piece in black and white. And then the other one was not that long ago, a piece on these women protesting for Ars Oscar Lopez Rivera, a Puerto Rican political prisoner. And the scene was just so goddamn colorful. I said, I'd be damned I'm going to put this in black and white because <laughs> it, it just popped in color. And so we ran it like that. But primarily it's in black and white. I shoot it in color and I desaturate the images and the technical parts of it. Uh, I'm the kind of photographer, I know enough about what I need to do. I don't get too bogged down in gear. I mean, I have the gear that I, I need to do the job. And 
what I do, I don't consider what I do to be photojournalism, to be honest. I mean, I'm a photographer, and I spend a lot of time thinking about photography, and I try to take pictures every day, uh, even if it's just with my phone, which is not a bad little phone camera, actually, it's another seven. Um, but I just try to think visually and, and keep my eye active the whole time. Now, as a journalist, you know, having had originally no intention of becoming a journalist, okay, um, that was like a girlfriend suggested I do that when I was kind of at sea. Um, but I was a photographer. So when I got into writing, my, my writing was visual. It was always visual. And the other thing was I, I loved working with photographers at the paper because we collaborate on stuff. You know, I, I have colleagues who like, you know, send in an assignment after they've done the reporting. It's like, you're stupid. The pictures aren't going to jive with the, with the reporting. You're going to miss stuff. And if you really mistreat your photographer, you, the photographers must see stuff that he or she is not going to tell you happened. <laughs> so you're going to be out of luck. But I, I was very fortunate to work with some really wonderful photographers, you know, primarily with my, my, like I said, my partner in crime, Angel, but you know, several others that I work closely with. Um, and I think my writing has helped my photography because my writing told me about storytelling and about narrative. And it gets to the point that when I'm thinking about the image for my column now, I'm thinking, does this tell the story? Because sometimes your favorite image is not the one that tells the story. You know, the one that tells the story is the one you got to use. Your favorite image, you might be able to use it in some other context. But it makes you think critically. And I think having experience in both, in, in, in visual and in written, I think both complement each other. And, and they strengthen me in different ways. Um, looking at photography and, and, and journalism and what I do, um, I mean, a lot of us were educated to, as journalists to think of this concept of objectivity is a very real standard, supposedly. Uh, when in fact, I mean, what, what a lot of us were trained, of, trained in classically as objectivity was the, per, the point of view of a white, male, upper-class, Ivy League-educated editor, often. <laughs> and that is seen as the default position, uh, which means a lot of other stuff, if that's a default position, you can imagine how other things get, get shifted around. And, you know... The other thing that got me growing up in the South Bronx, when it was burning, when there were gangs, um, and no, I didn't see drugs in my neighborhood when I was a kid. We saw the neighborhood junkie, but that was about it, or people sniffing glue. Uh, we didn't have guns in our neighborhood. We had a lot of poor people. We had a lot of fires in our neighborhood. We had a lot of abandoned buildings. We had people eating government cheese. <laughs> but, you know, we also had a full life, a full community. And I think people forget that. Um, and my profession, has been guilty, I think, of, of equating black and brown dysfunction with serious journalism. That, you know, when we're talking of communities of color and we're talking about photography, you know, we're going to show people broke down, we're going to show them vulnerable. I'm not saying we don't have to, but, you know, and I'm not going to get into naming names. Some of you know me, know the people I'm talking about. <laughs> There's a problem with that because it basically fetishizes poverty and continues to treat us as people who are incapable or unworthy of telling their own stories. And I don't buy that. I do not buy that. Now granted, you're talking to somebody who's a senior writer of the New York Times with you know, Ivy League degrees and all this other stuff, but I don't buy it. I think it's, it, it's, a, it's a specious argument because the fact is we're all shaped by our experiences. Everything that shapes us, we bring it to the table, whether we're aware of it or not. Ideally, we're aware of it so we can check ourselves when we're doing stories and saying, is this the right thing or am I falling? onto some preconceived notions. Um, but, you know, you have to be alert about these things. And, again, it's a question of what I see. And I started doing this as a photographer. So, you know, everybody talks about you know, giving agency to people. You know, it's a fancy way of just saying, you know, meeting people where they're at and, and displaying the reality of their lives. Because um, if not, we exoticize people. Um, I saw, I was at the Nat Geo seminar a couple of years ago. And uh, Lauren Greenfield Sanders showed work in progress. And she's been doing a lot of work on, on wealth and, and things like that. And she was showing some slides. And she showed one slide of a prostitute, a, a woman who worked at a brothel in Nevada. White woman, fully clothed, still photographed. It's just the image had to speak for itself. She then begins to explain how this, is, this woman had gone to college, had a degree in sociology or in social work, but found she could make more money working in a legal brothel than working in social work. She then shows later on um, a video at a black strip club in Miami 
and shows a black woman wearing a thong and nothing else on her knees picking up dollars. The minute the woman opens her mouth, you can tell this is someone who is educated. She presented herself in a certain way that just told you this is a very different person. There's a story there, obviously. However, no effort was made to get that story out. The still photograph of the white prostitute, the photographer felt compelled to explain this woman had a college degree. Whereas the black stripper on her knees picking up dollar bills, no such explanation was given, although Ruddy Roy did ask at the end of it, what's up with that? You know, a bunch of us did. There weren't that many of us, actually. That, you, know, you could count the people of color on two hands, actually, at, at that event. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, whether it's with my own work, whether it's with my comrades in Los Seis, or whether it's as the co-editor of Lens, which has taken the game to a very different level now, that's what guides me. You know, what are we presenting here? You know, we get pitched stuff all the time of you know intrepid photojournalists going to some places and you know giving us stuff that ain't new. It's kind of like going over the same stuff, and I get very uneasy about these things that traffic in, in misery without any context or just like thinking that this is what we have to show when we show swarthy people. That they have to be miserable, obviously. I mean, you know, some of the best pictures I saw in Africa last year was like this guy did a series on barbershops in Africa. And it was great. It was great. It was visually dazzling. It was like you're being bombarded by pop culture, traditional culture. And you know, that's Africa, man. It's a freaking continent with a whole bunch of countries. That's just one thing. But you know, stuff like that. So, you know, that's the common thread is for me is challenging the established narrative in whatever way I can. Uh, I can be a smart ass, I can be difficult, and I can be hard headed. I know that. Um, but this is what I try to do. Um, I mean, my background I'm Puerto Rican, raised in the South Bronx, educated in Catholic schools. I'm still a practicing Catholic, and uh, I came up in a blue collar family. And all those things affect who I am. All those things affect how I look at the world, whether I realize it or not. Ideally, one should be aware of these things because they could, they could influence you for good and they can influence you for bad also. I mean, they could blind you to certain things. So you've got to be aware of those things. But, you know, if you look at the stuff that I do for myself, and this is kind of fun. I've got to thank Jaime for this because I, I almost never talk about my photography except when we have our, 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 our exhibits with Los Seis. And then, you know, I'll talk about it. But, you know, I spend most of my day either doing my column where the column speaks for itself or talking about other people's photography. So I, I welcome you. Oh, I got him. I'm, I'm about to. I'm about to. Don't worry. I'm, I, I got pictures here. Don't worry. But, you know, you know, all these things shame me. So what do I look at? I look at the Bronx. I look at street photography from my days of wanting to be the, the Puerto Rican Lee Friedlander. Um, I look at hip-hop. I look at graffiti. I look at religion and the role it plays in daily life, especially in Latino communities where the deeply... I mean, New York City in general is the deeply religious place, whether you know, people on the Upper West Side want to acknowledge that or not but it's one of the most religious places I've ever seen. Um, but before all that happened, I grew up in the Bronx. So we're gonna look at some pictures now. See, I told you, I had pictures, B. Oh, ye of little faith. Here we go. That's the South Bronx, actually. That's Hunts Point, a neighbor that some photographers are likely to think is just overrun with zombie junkies and prostitutes. I won't say who he is, but he knows who he is. Um, this is Hunts Point. You'd think you were like some, you know, some uh, swimming uh, hole in the country in upstate New York. But this is uh, Hunts Point Riverside Park. And there's a reason for this bucolic s scene, actually. This was in a column I did about how that part of the South Bronx didn't have a single public pool. And so kids took to jumping off a newly constructed pier. <laughs> and so I shot this scene looking like you're in the country, but saying, you're in actually Hunts Point. <laughs> And they don't have a pool. They do now. They have the floating pool lady. But back then, they didn't. So kids would jump off there. So this is the Bronx. Surprise. This is the South Bronx. Surprise. This is Hunt's Point. And there's not a hooker or a junkie in sight. I really screwed this up, obviously. The Bronx, the Puerto Rican center of the universe. This neighborhood. I mean, this is where I was born. I mean, this is like a block away from where I was born, to be honest. Um, but, you know, the Bronx is... You know, the center of the Puerto Rican universe, as Ricky Flores, another member of my collective, we call this neighborhood Longwood Intervale. It's, it's the center of the known Puerto Rican universe. You talk to any Puerto Rican, one of them, they have somebody who went through this neighborhood at some point. <laughs> Let me put it that way. Um, and 
you know, we got flags everywhere. We love our flags. Again, this is, you know, Puerto Ricans in the Bronx, my God, they're not unemployed, they're not all dejected, they're not you know, walking around in their t-shirts playing dominoes on a corner. We got the old viveros, which is interesting because that's showing the, the change in the Bronx. I mean, when I was a kid, you went to the vivero. Nowadays, you get a lot of the African Muslims shopping there. So this, this institution continues, but serving a different population now. So I, I, and this was from a column I did, actually, where I was just walking by one day, and I saw these really rough and tough construction guys petting one of the goats. <laughs> petting. And of course, the goat was oblivious to its eventual fate, but these guys were having a good time petting it. And I, I started a conversation with the guy who takes care of the animals there. And I, I wrote a piece, a reminiscence on, um, on going to the Vivero with my father and what it was like. Um, you know, and just like, just the smell of this, which would knock you on your butt. Um, was like for me, you know, how did I put it? You know, Proust had his Madeleine, I had a, a dead chicken. It's a tough town. Um, but that, these are the things I look for, these kinds of signs of change. Again, you know, this is outside the Bronx documentary said they had an exhibit of the work of, um, what's your name, your boy? Ben Fernandez, thank you. Um, and I saw the, this African woman walking by with her kids, and I said, that's a nice juxtaposition there. I really went out to photograph the, the, you know, the MLK with the light, and then she, I saw her coming up, so I said, well, let me pull back a bit here. But again, this is the changes in the borough. <coughs> again, more, you know, it, it, you, you still have recent Italian immigrants in some parts of the Bronx. This guy obviously was this during the World Cup when I was at the Arthur Avenue Market, and I ran into a friend of his there, and I had to photograph him. We have this crazy Christmas house run by an Armenian family for the last 35 years, the, the Garabedian Christmas house on Pelham Parkway. That's also in the Bronx. You know, I mean, you know, Diker Heights in Brooklyn does not have the market cornered on crazy Christmas houses. We have one really crazy one in the Bronx where you have, you know, Teresa Little Flower next to Marie Antoinette. And around the, around the front, you got Michael Jackson, Diana Ross, and, and Audrey Hepburn a la Breakfast at Tiffany's with the hat and all that other stuff in the gloves. It's, it's, and they move. It's really freaky. It's the Bronx. The greatest Puerto Rican who ever walked the earth, Roberto Clemente. This was the first statue of a Puerto Rican erected in New York City. Hard to believe. Um, and it was placed at Roberto Clemente State Park, actually. But again, you know, I, I was interested in doing just the image of the thing, but these Boy Scouts, these young black and brown men, these kids, looking up to Roberto, as you know, my generation always did. And so you know, the traditions get passed on, not because he was a great ball player, although he was, but he was an even greater humanitarian. And those are the kind of things that get lost when people talk about our communities. I mean, you know, we do have our heroes. You may not know who they are, but we have them, and we celebrate them in a borough that you tend to write off. I just love homegrown. I mean, it's like there are these free old school hip hop jams in Cretona Park every summer. And this girl was just doing her thing. And I just had to take a picture because she had, at least like six years old, she had the moves down. And again, this is like, you know, this is Cortona Park in the Bronx, you know, but you don't really know that until I told you. You think you're somewhere else, maybe. Old school murals with the, the shell top, the uh, hangar and what have you. This is gone. I photograph a lot of graffiti because, one, I know a lot of guys who do it, mostly guys. But there are a few women who were really good at it and to give any guy a run for his money. But um, a lot of this stuff is ephemeral. It goes. And so I try to, a couple of us try to take proper pictures of it. We know the artists. We give them pictures for their websites or whatever. Um, but of course, everything changes and we get Banksy in the South Bronx. Um, and they actually, you know, he did it and they roped it off and whatnot. And we know the Bronx is being gentrified now. I mean, you told me that 20 years ago, I would have said you, you're hitting the rock, obviously. But it's true. The, you know, the, co the poorest congressional district, urban congressional district, you know, in Port Mars, they're building luxury towers. They plan to build seven luxury towers in the poorest urban congressional district, right next to like a ton of projects. Good luck with that. But that's what they're talking about now. It's all, you know, let's erase the past. Let's bring in street art into the into the borough where like they kind of invented graffiti. Bringing in this guy, and I like some of his work, but really, I'll show you another picture later to show you how some writers in the Bronx responded to him. A writer is a graffiti artist, by the way. But then this is the Bronx where it's going, but this is where it was in 1960. That's me. I'm the little guy in the middle. And that's my pops, my mom, and my older brother. And that's at Ferry Point Park, 
Um, behind them now is Donald Trump's golf course. Back then it wasn't there. This is what the South Bronx looked like when I returned to it in 1979. This is Cypress Avenue, 138th Street. And um, different people read different things into images. You look at this and say, oh, it's, it's tragic, it's falling apart, it's burned out. Um, yeah, it is, but there's a reason why that church is there. One, I mean, obviously the physical reason, you know, churches are made out of stone, you can't burn stone. Um, but also, when everybody fled the Bronx, you know, the Catholic Church stayed. They didn't move. And, and the good ones, they organized, real organizing. Um, and it got to the point in the 70s where people like Neil Connolly, who I wrote about last, year, last week, he died. Um, he was the vicar of the South Bronx, but he was told by the Cardinal, no, don't worry about the pastoral stuff, do organizing. Organize the people, which is an amazing concept. I don't think we'd see that now under current administration. Um, but for me, this picture actually is a picture of hope. It's not a picture of devastation. Yeah, it's not a picture of devastation. It's a picture of an institution that helped save our community and give us back what we rightly deserved with dignity. And people tend to forgive, forget that. And again, sometimes the dominant view is one of a secular humanist view, but for those of us who know the role of religion in some of these communities, it's a very important role that goes way beyond whatever happens on, on, on Sunday or Saturday. It has real ramifications. But that was how it looked like. This is also how it looked like. This is on Charlotte Street in Boston. Remember Charlotte Street where all, everybody wanted to run for office would come by and say, I want your vote, and then they'd do nothing? Um, this is Charlotte Street. This is where I taught at CS61. I taught photography when I was in Focal. That's Bella de Leon all the way at the left, another photographer who worked with me. And we taught fourth graders in the school. We called it visual literacy because it was easier to get a grant that way, but it was photography. <laughs> you know, we had instant cameras. We showed them make shoe, you know, pinhole cameras at shoeboxes, and you know, they got pissed off. We said, we're, we're gonna make cameras today, and then we give them shoeboxes. Like, What's that? A camera? No, this is a camera, believe it. Um, but all those buildings in the background, they're all deserted. This is what we would, this is where these kids lived. This is what they showed us. But the interesting thing with these kids is that when they showed us the pictures they took, they weren't showing us pictures of like, you know, horrible, sad, broke down people. They were showing pictures of like, you know, playing, hanging out at home, making goofy faces. I still have Polaroids I took of a Halloween party with these kids that just still make me laugh. Um, and so here's, again, what are you looking at when you look at these landscapes? Are you looking at the emptiness or are you looking at the life? Now, personally, I'd rather look at the life. Again, this is on Charlotte Street. I was coming home one day and these kids were like, yo, take my picture, take my picture. And then I realized they're like, you know, just squeezing this dog that's trying to get out <laughs> in the middle of it. <laughs> and I just thought it was so cool because back in those days also you'd walk and they'd tell you, you know, take my picture. It's like they, and, you know, they demanded that you take a picture. So I would. I like photographing kids because I, I, this is where I play. I played in places like this when I was a kid. You know, in the schoolyard with some graffiti there. There's Jimmy Haha's in here somewhere, I know. Yeah, up in the upper left corner. Jimmy Haha's one of the big guys from the old days. Buck is also, Buck too is one of the other guys. But again, this is PS 86 by the Kingswood Army. That's what it looked like. But again, you know, these kids are just, you know, probably drawing designs, <laughs> more of wall work. Again, this is down by the hub. It's not what you think it is. It is an empty building, but an artist had taken it over, and he would take rubble from the building, and then using industrial plastic, stuff the plastic with rubble, fashioning torsos that he would then people the building with. It's pretty wild. This guy was with Fashion Moda. Those of you who are old enough remember Fashion Moda, which was a, this groundbreaking gallery that took people from the downtown scene, like Jenny Holzer, Tom Otter, Miss Charlie Ahern, and hook them up with people in the Bronx, like you know the Rocksteady crew, Crash, Days, and all those guys. And so it was a meeting of uptown and downtown. And unlike some collaborations, they were as equals. It wasn't like you know the folks from downtown going to hang out with the poor ghetto kids. They both learned from each other, and they both collaborated. So someone like Jane Dixon, who's a pretty well-established artist, Jane was doing collaborations with Crash. They they built an indoor labyrinth, which cat which Crash decorated. And they actually Crash now has a gallery. And he actually replicated the labyrinth uh, last summer. This is how we do it. Now imagine a basement room in an abandoned building, totally dark, and you walk in, there are like maybe 30 of these suckers lying on the wall. <laughs> yeah, I was with a friend of mine. He almost, he bugged, let me put it that way. It was scary. 
again, before hip hop became this global industry, it was just like neighborhood crews. This was the Rockwell Association, an early, an early b-boy crew. You know, and they just had like those iron-on letters on their shirts. You know, the iron-on felt letters. That was like that was like high style. If they really wanted style, they'd have their pumas. You know, but these are the early crews. This is what they looked like it was before it became this global industry. Just a bunch of kids, Puerto Rican and black. Don't believe the Get Down on, on Netflix. It was Puerto Ricans and blacks together. Because listen, I mean, we grew up in the same neighborhoods. We went to the same schools. It was like the blacks did their thing. I mean, the other blacks had the R and B and whatnot. But you know, they dug boogaloo, you know, and we all like rock and roll. Believe it or not, you know, people, people came up together. That's 78. These are like 78 through 82. Squeegee kids getting off the Deegan. They run up and clean your windows. That's on Fordham and the Deegan. One of my favorite pictures down by the Mott Haven Library. I was with Rafael Ramirez, who used to do a lot of stuff with Enfoco. He was one of my best friends. Great street photographer. And we had a, a, a street gallery. We were showing pictures on the street. And um, these kids came up. And they said, take my picture. I have a whole bunch of pictures just from this perspective of all these different kids coming up to me. And, um, you know, I just loved it because you had all this crazy stuff here. And somebody once asked me, oh, is this a commentary on violence? Because this neighbor got pretty nasty about 10 years after I took this video. This neighbor got crazy. I mean, it was overrun by a group called the Wild Cowboys who got rico out of existence after a gun battle that left five people dead on one block. It was insane. And somebody said, like, oh, did you do this as a commentary on violence and innocence? And I said, no. I just kind of like their goofy faces and all these different guns coming at you as compositional elements. I mean, it was fun. I used to play with guns like that. Yeah, it was kind of fun. But you look, boys, girls. The difference between boys and girls. I have a son and a daughter. I can relate to this. Boys, girls. <laughs> I heard from the girl on the right. She was the night manager at the Hotel Pennsylvania when this story came out. So it's nice to hear that you know she went on to do something. And her brother is the kid on the left, on the bottom. And he has a landscape business out in the North Fork. Again, from the heart of the South Bronx. The old ladies with their babushkas on Fordham Road. Fordham still had a lot of old Jewish ladies back in those days. And they always hung out right there by Alexander's. Inside Alexander's, I just always found this bizarre. This kid just sitting there. I don't know what he did to deserve that, but he's just sitting there. I just thought it was good. And, you know, and then an older dapper gent with his newspaper. Again, street photography on Fordham. That we, you know, we, we, we get permission to go to the Puerto Rican Declaration for that. They let us cross the bridge into Manhattan. <laughs> and again, this is before the parade got super crazy commercial, before you had, you know, Coors putting out cans of beer with the Puerto Rican flag on it. <laughs> it was just a, you know, a much more laid back kind of event. And the guy had a kiss me on Puerto Rican button. Yes, he did. <laughs> he kind of looks like, for those of you who know Latin music, he, he kind of looks like Mon Rivera. <laughs> Again, this is like the reviewing stand at the Puerto Rican Day Parade, which now they probably charge you money to get in there and be sponsored. Back then, it was some kid from Webster Avenue and this woman giving me a goofy face. They're just hanging out. It was like, you know, I'm not saying it was a more innocent era, but it was just, things were a lot more accessible. Let me put it, I didn't need a press pass to wander around. I just walked around with my cameras and took pictures and talked to people. Ese Guido de Lares, he was famous on 125th, but also on Fordham Road in the Bronx. In my generation, we all knew him on Fordham Road. And he um, was a blind guy who um, played tropical music. And for me, I grew up in a family of musicians. I, mean, I never learned how to play an instrument. I learned how to play records. But my father played guitar, and I grew up with live music in the house. And I always thought that my father's music, my father was a handyman. His music kept him sane, and I know it did. Um, and I like to think that this guy also, his music, and I got to know his grandson. After this was published, his grandson called me. And we became friends, actually, um, David Rubo, and told me the backstory of Ese And, uh, you know, he was pretty well known. Um, recorded one album, which I have a copy of. Um, he actually has a song called Seguito de Lares Rock and Roll. It's not rock and roll, trust me. Um, but it is a Seguito de Lares. But again, uh, for me, this is presenting our culture and what our culture means to us. And our culture can be a lifeline if you're in an unfamiliar place. I'm Puerto Rican. I have to have a roof photograph. I mean, 
let's face it, when you look at any Puerto Rican's family picture album, you're going to see a roof picture or two. Uh, this is my contribution to the genre. Now, that's old school graffiti. Now we're going to go right to the present. This is contemporary graffiti. This is John Matos, also known as Crash. He started out bombing trains, bombing meaning painting over trains at night illegally. He now paints guitars for Eric Clapton. Um, he's having an exhibit in Lyon next week. Uh, he has another one in the Netherlands in the fall. And his name is Crash. He, was, he went to Murray Bertram High School, and he was taking computer science, and he crashed the system. And that's how he got graffiti name. So he crashed the system. Um, he has a gallery in the South Bronx. Uh, represent, I mean, you know, shows a lot of really good people, and um, you know, is a person who's in charge of his destiny. He's a business person. You know, a lot of the times they, these people come from down and say, "Oh, we'd like to feature your work. You know, can you give it to us for free?" And he's like, "No, <laughs> no, it don't work like that." In this is one of the most prolific graffiti writers ever, and I can't tell you who it is, unfortunately. <laughs> but there's one guy in this picture whose tag has been showing up illegally for about 30 years. He's everywhere. He's everywhere. His name is Bester. You might have seen him. You might have seen his tag, Bester. It's just curvy letters about this long. Um, this is at a party in Hunts Point for some graffiti writers, and a whole bunch of people showed up, including the guy that I can't point out, unfortunately. <laughs> but, you know, again, it continues. This, this subculture continues. These, these people are a lot older now, and some of them are very well-established artists, you know, who are teaching, who are traveling, exhibiting, and selling their work, and doing it very well. This is probably the leading mural crew in the South Bronx, is Tats crew, and um, these guys. And you've seen their work in the Lower East Side. You've seen it all over the Bronx. Um, I mean, they travel everywhere to, to do their stuff. I mean, they manufacture their stuff in, in China when they have to have stuff printed. They actually fly over there and negotiate. So they, they, and again, these guys started out just dashing in the yards at night. But you know, they, they, they were doing a full wall of a building that was about to be demolished. And the landlord said, well, you could have it. You know, we'll pay you to do it for three months. And they put it up. The building's since been demolished. This is Bio. This is the guy with the hat, the second guy from the left. This is him cast by John Ahern, another artist who's done a lot of work in the South Bronx. John does life casts of people. You might have seen his work elsewhere. But this was done over the summer, uh, a live cast of Bio, holding spray cans. <laughs> this is his partner in crime, Nicer, who's a joker. He's always a joker. And whenever I take a picture of, of Nicer, he's making some kind of face. And this was at his birthday party, and he had you know, the nectar of the gods, Coco Rico. So <laughs> and he had that, this, this angelic look on his face. I had to photograph. I had a much more serious shot of him but this kind of captures the kind of person he is. This is the most stylish graffiti writer in the South Bronx, a guy named Pretty Tone. And we were just hanging out on a, on a, on a green roof, by the way, <laughs> in Hunts Point. And the light was such, I said, homeboy, I gotta take your picture. And so here we go with, you know, Tone, who's, again, he's, he's one of the associate members of Tats crew. This is in the back of where Tats grabs their offices. They have a plywood wall that's, you know, exact dimensions of an old, train. And so you can go back and paint something that's like the size of a whole car. And what's interesting is they change it every week. So this stuff is ephemeral. This doesn't exist anymore. Nor does this. When Cheo Feliciano died, the great Puerto Rican singer, the great salsa singer, um, BG183, who's the guy with the white shirt, hooked up with Jamie Heff. You might have seen Heff's work out in Brooklyn. Heff is big. Heff's with the black shirt. And they decided to do a, a tribute wall to Cheo. This wall existed for a total of less than 24 hours. These guys knocked, it's very zen. These guys knocked it out. Me and Ricky Flores photographed it. And then the next day I went back with a, a better camera to shoot it. And they said, it's gone. And they had buffed it. It was ready for another crew to come in and paint. But I think that tells you something about their discipline. And these are other, again, these are walls that are long gone. This is a California, some California artists came to Boone Avenue in the South Bronx to do big pieces. Boone was like one of the hidden graffiti galleries in the Bronx. By a gallery, I mean in the street. But there were like four long surfaces of buildings that were covered with really great street art you know, by artists from all over the world, not just, you know, from the Bronx. And this was these two folks in L.A. that did Fresh Bros. And it's gone. It's 
they building affordable housing there now. Then you got more contemporary stuff, like when Bernie, there's a big wall by the vegan for Bernie, and they had a little detail of Bernie with, with the president. <laughs> so that's also, you know, kind of like Bronx attitude in, uh, in graffiti. This is Nick 707, Welfare Fred up on the wall. That's his stage name. He also is a stand-up comic, believe it or not. He's pretty funny. But he also now, what he does now is, he's an old school writer. Um, he takes pieces of uh, plexiglass that are shaped like the ad inserts in the subway, does pieces like that one up there with the thunderbolts, and he gets other people to do them like really big people, like Taki 183, one of the first writers ever. They get on the train at the first stop, nobody's there, and then they take out all the ads and they put these in. And then they ride all the way in the line and they take them out. And nobody figures it out. <laughs> and so he's putting graffiti back onto where he believes it belongs, in the subway. And that's, that's been his contribution, you know, putting it back. And he does this every week. If you look at his Instagram feed, you'll see it. He's doing it. And they get a whole bunch of artists, including some non-graffiti types who were just, you know, into graphic design. So if you're ever on, like, the one train, he likes the one. Um, and all of a sudden, you see this guy walk in with three other guys, and they're scoping it out. And then the minute the doors close, they start doing it. <laughs> you know what's happening. This was a Banksy in the South Bronx. Yeah. He had done a cheetah over here. And I saw it one night when I was with my son in the neighborhood. And I had my camera, but it was too late to get out and walk around with gear with my kid. So I went home. The next day, I said, I'm going to go back. This is what I found. This is what happened to Banksy in the South Bronx. That other Banksy you saw, that now has a roll-down gate. The landlord of the building knows he has something valuable. He Nobody can see it. It's protected by a roll-down gate. You lift up the gate. There's just a wall. There's no door. There's that Banksy piece that you saw. But, you know, a lot of graffiti writers were kind of pissed off about Banksy coming to the Bronx and everybody going, ooh, ah, ah. It's it's the Bronx, homie. It's like we invented this over here, okay? So what are you doing? And people felt that this was like kind of like a diss, that everybody's going, ooh, and over this guy. And it's not graffiti, because, I mean, you want to talk about graffiti. It's like, you know, graffiti's about the, you know, the, the hand styles, the kinetic motion, the lettering. You know, he's, I like his work. But, you know, when you come into the Bronx, this is what could happen. He got buffed. He got buffed. And... Uh, that's how we play it up there. I mean, I know some, I, yeah, I have suspicions as to who might have done it, but you know, it could have been any of a number of people. This is one of a, an old school graph guy who's taken to the next level. This is Carlos Mayer. Um, he started out doing, uh, like everybody else, doing trains. Now he does web design, but he also does metal sculpture using graffiti lines. And I mean, he just came back from showing his work in Morocco a month ago. Um, this is a kid, again, he started out, his first stash of metal that he started sculpting with, he stole it from a train yard. <laughs> He'll admit it now, statute of limitations is over. But that's what he wanted, he felt he needed to do something. And it spoke to him, and he, like, took it to another level. If you watch the BET Awards, they give out a star, he designed that. That's his design. You know, so he gets around, and you know, conversations with, with Carlos are pretty interesting because he's very well read. He thinks about things a lot, and he has definite opinions. So this is when No Longer Empty did their thing in Sugar Hill, and uh, they invited him. And I did a column, and I decided to do a portrait of him, kind of like being eaten by his work. John Ahern, the guy who does Lifecast, this is his storage room. Right, yeah, and these are all based on real, every single statue there is a real person that he knew, or still knows. And I, I wanted to do a portrait of him, and he's a really hard guy to photograph. I mean, he's next to impossible to photograph. But I said, let's go to your storage room. And you walk in, and you just, you know, li you know, the lights are dim, and it's like you see these figures, it's really spooky. Um, but again, this is, and he still works in the South Bronx. He lives in El Barrio now. He spent a long time living in the South Bronx. He lives in El Barrio. Uh, but his studio is still in the South Bronx, over on 139th and 3rd. The Fresh Bros mural, I knew I was going to figure out a way to use it in the paper. I did a profile. This is the man who kind of like pulled it all together. This is Michael Holman. He, um, he's, a, he's a jack of all trades. Filmmaker, backup dancer, was in a band with Basquiat. I mean, he's done everything. But he had a TV show that had one episode, Graffiti Rock. One episode. 
people are still talking about it to this day. You had like a cool, you know, a young cool Moldy, young Run DMC. You had Debbie Mazar as a B-girl dancing in the crowd. It was it was wild. But he started bringing in elements of graffiti, break dancing and rapping, and he put it on TV. You know, all the elements of the culture, if you will. And uh, you know, people remembered him for that. And so when I wanted to photograph him, I, I knew exactly the wall I wanted. I wanted that fresh rose wall behind him. And it continues in the Bronx to this day. This guy on the ground, that's, that's Chief 69, uh, who's a young b-boy who just, any, if there's any b-boying to be done anywhere in the five boroughs, he'll be the first one there and the last one to go. He's like 25 years old. He was born 25 years too late. But he's really into the culture in a very positive way. But again, in the Bronx, you don't have to pay anything. These are free. This is Behagen Playground by the Forest Projects in, the, in Morrisania. And there's Kaz. He hosts, he's like what they call the forever host. Whenever they have these jams, he's the guy on the microphone, you know, calling the shots. Uh, and again, this is free in the Bronx in a park. You don't have to, like, go to Madison Square Garden. You don't have to go anywhere. You just go to the neighborhood, and it's free. And the other thing is, you know, you talk about how, how dangerous this stuff is. And granted, the forest projects, they're hot. But whenever you go to any of these events, it's chill. I've never been at one of these events where anything jumped off. Seriously, nothing. It's, you know, people are into the culture, people are into the music, and people are into this family vibe. And that's just how it works. And again, this is the reality as opposed to the perception of, like, what hip-hop is all about in, these, in the South Bronx. That's a slick Rick. <laughs> this is, I mean... Let's put it this way. The mannequin is Slick Rick. The guy with Mandy, that's Ricky. That's Ricky. That's, that's Rick at home. You know, and I was doing a piece about how his, finally his legal problems are all over. He's going to become a citizen and not be deported. And I you know, went to talk to him. He, he was smart. He's West Indian, so he bought real estate with his money. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't spend it on, on, on stupid stuff. He didn't buy cars or chains, although he obviously has chains. But he bought houses. And this is where he lives in the Bronx, in the Co-op City. It's a two-family house. That's where he's at, and that's with his wife. And, you know, it was just the man and the persona behind him. And that's what I was kind of trying to get at. That's the, the, the guy, the mannequin is the Ricky we all know on stage. But the man is this guy with his wife who helped him through his crises. Because, you know, he was being, you know, the U.S. government was trying to deport him. Because he came here illegally when he was like 11 from the U.K., We got Biz Markey coming up to the Bronx on the left, and again, that's Grandmaster Kaz. Again, at, at, a, at one of these parties in uh, Cortona Park. The culture continues, whether or not it's recognized commercially. The grassroots nature of the culture is, is still alive. <laughs> then you go, I'm looking at, you know, this is a transition picture. This is, I, I do a lot of stuff on religion. I went to 52 Park uh, in the South Bronx, at 152nd Street around there, off Beck. They have salsa concerts every summer. And I mean, I'm talking about major ones. They, 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 get, they get like a gran combo there, okay? And they charge people five bucks to check it out. It's, it's amazing. They stopped because the guy who ran it had a stroke three years ago. They haven't had one since. But I got there early because I was going to photograph something there. And this guy was sitting there. And I just saw the hat with all these Nino Divinos on it, those little Jesus figures. And I was like, and the Yankee thing, I said, I got to photograph this guy. So, you know, I, I don't take a picture and walk away. I started talking to him first. And his name is Mr. Palladium, and that's because he used to, in the 50s, dance at the Palladium, and he loved dancing. He's like 92. And it was funny, because the quote he gave me, and I didn't use it, because I really wasn't writing about it, but I remember it, so he goes, these kids today, they spin and spin and spin, and they call that dancing? That's not dancing, that's spinning. <laughs> you know, you have to have steps, you have to know how to move with somebody. Um, and um, he did. But I, I just found his face very expressive, but, you know, dressed in white with collares, and then it's like, I don't know if those are real collares or, those, you know, toy collares with your kids. I mean, it's, it's just all these different elements mixed in there. This was um, Justo Botanica. His name is Jorge. He, he passed away two years ago, but Justo had a Botanica. His father was Justo, and he had a Botanica on 104th and Lexington since the 40s. And then his landlord pushed him out because they wanted the storefront to, to build something more necessary. 7-Eleven, um, and so he moved up to 106th and Lex, where he had his botanica, and I like it because it's like he's a modern day, you know, modern day Sampero. He's like, you know, we accept credit cards, and you can follow him on Twitter. Um, but you know, again, these are institutions that are kind of on the way out. Um, I mean, 
more recent African immigration to the city, give them a new customer base to some extent, and other people, you know, traditional Latinos would also come by. But it was interesting, the, the kind of different people that came. That Holy Week at La Gruta, which is also known as the Lords of America. La Gruta is the grotto up by St. Lucy's Church in the Bronx, and they have, on the other side of this, they have like an actual Virgin Mary in a grotto with water coming down, and people get it, and they drink it, and they cure themselves. Um, I was there one day in Holy Week, and I saw this guy walking up the steps, and he just dropped to his knees, and, and there's a, a whole crucifixion scene in there, and he just dropped to his knees and started praying, and um, I decided I wasn't going to get any closer. I, when I covered religion, it was I, I realized very quickly it's it's kind of dangerous to ask people what they pray for. You don't know how they're going to react. I once did a piece on why people pray to Saint Jude, the patron of the of the hopeless. Um, it's hard. I mean, people are hopeless. You can imagine. You know, can you tell me and my readers what you're praying for? Then you know the the sacred and the profane side by side. A, a, a memorial wall right next to the um, an ad for um, the legend of Despero. I'm pretty up on all my animated movies. I have two children. That's all I see is animated movies when I go to the theater. <laughs> Wasn't a bad flick, though. Again, our traditions are such that we are, as Latinos, expressive visually and publicly about remembering people. That's part of why we have memorial walls, is people are remembered and they stay among us still. Um, this is interesting. This is a... It's Carmen Villegas. Now, Carmen Villegas was a very active lay person in Our Lady Queen of Angels on 113th Street between 2nd and 3rd. That church was closed by Cardinal Egan, I think in 2007 maybe, and the parishioners pleaded with him to keep it open. And Carmen and a bunch of other women, yes, pretty much all women, did a sit-in, and the cardinal had them arrested. The church was closed down, but given to a different order, Father Stan's order. Uh, a very conservative Franciscan order of nuns are living in the rectory and they use the church periodically. When Carmen died, they asked the archdiocese, could we please have her service in the church that she loved? And they said no. So being good Puerto Rican women, they said, okay, be like that. So they had it on the sidewalk outside the church. <laughs> and that was in my column. But this is like they said, we're going to put it on the sidewalk. That's it. And that's what they did. They had a, a two-hour prayer service on the sidewalk in front of a shuttered church. A lady of Mount Carmel up in, up in East Harlem, where you get a lot of Haitians now uh, when they have their festival. Pentecostals. Again, the Virgin Mary. I went to visit my father's grave, and I turned around, and I see these two bottles of Remy and the Virgin Mary. <laughs> Again, just looking at how... We remember people. This is at the old Nativity Church on 2nd Avenue. They actually did a production of a play in the sanctuary. This is up at Sing Sing. This guy on the left is doing uh, life for three counts of murder. The guy on the right is doing, I think, 20 years for a serious assault. But they, one of these guys, the guy on the right had done a drawing of the Pope and given it to him through an intermediary, and the Pope gave him a, a personal message. And so this is at the chapel at Sing Sing actually, when they opened it up and they started talking about it. The baptistry at, at um, St. Ansem's in the Bronx, which actually looks a lot like the Hagia Sophia. It's the same kind of architecture. This is where I was baptized, literally, in 1957. I, I was doing a piece on this architectural history, uh, restorer, and I decided, fate would have it that the best picture was in the place where I was baptized. <laughs> Church of Nativity, after it was closed, all are welcome. No. <laughs> This guy stands out there and hands out free food that he gets from local restaurants. Father Fenlon visiting the homebound elderly and a very traditional Puerto Rican woman who's dressed up when he got there. And when he blesses her, he, she insists on kneeling for the blessing. One of my favorite pictures is an actual farm in the South Bronx called La Finca del Sur. And um, this is, these are two Mexican kids whose father has a plot. And he's from Puebla. And he grew up in a farming community. He says, I want my children to learn the traditions. So it's being carried on in the South Bronx in a real farm. These kids are learning what their father learned in Puebla, in the Bronx. I love these things, these, when, these doors in the Bronx. When I was a kid, you always had these stickers. Somos católicos y contento. We're, we're Catholic and happy. That's like the anti-Jehovah's Witness sticker. Don't knock on my door, please. You know, or like, or like um, Spike Lee said in uh, Crooklyn, hell no. Um, 
These are variations. So it's like, yo amo a Cristo, but then I love this one. Don't smoke weed in the hall. Sick person here. So, you know, you got it covered. You got Jesus, but you also got, just don't smoke herbie, okay? It's Hunts Point Contemporary. Use parts from the radiator woman. Which parts? One of my favorite pictures, I was just hanging out one day listening to bomba music these guys are doing, and they started a circle where people were blessing each other and passing sage. And, and, and he was just playing his drum. It's Dr. Drum, Jose Ortiz. And I, I like it because it kind of symbolizes what the music means to us, which is like it's a real way to convene community. It's not just a performance. It's a way of life, as he says. One of the most famous people you've never heard of, that's, that's, that's Mike Amadeo, Casa Amadeo record store in the South Bronx. He himself is a noted composer of hundreds of songs that were performed by Gran Combo, Celia Cruz, Hector Lobo. He wrote the first big hit for Hector Lobo when Hector went solo after he split off from Willie. This man is at his store every day. You could walk in and just start talking to him. I mean, this is like, this man is a repository of, of, of boleros and salsa that you wouldn't believe. And he tell you all these stories, because all these musicians pass by his store. I mean, I was there like last summer and this guy comes in there talking, he leaves, that looks familiar, who is it? That's someone, so he's the lead singer of a Gran Combo. Yeah, they just come by. One of our great guys, Dave Valentin, who passed away recently, but I did a piece on Dave when he was about to lose this house. And somebody read this piece and helped him get better housing. But again, I wanted to photograph, David had a stroke, I didn't want to photo <coughs> photograph him all broke down, I wanted to photograph him in a way that sure gave you an essence of who this man was. And he, he, the guy won Grammys, he traveled the world, he was amazing. He, he, he performed in six of the seven continents. I mean, our friend Father Stan is like this Franciscan fire who's a really good jazz bassist. And he asked me for a favor, so I did this for the cover of one of his albums. But he's in the South Bronx also. I did a piece on how we lost all these major figures in Puerto Rican culture in New York. And I decided to do a thing on what is the challenge of being a Puerto Rican in New York City. And I thought a hibaro, which is what this guy is, a hibaro in the snow by the projects, taking a selfie, he's a 21st century hibaro. I was trying to like, you know, combine all these different worlds that we as Puerto Ricans do every day. We traverse various cultures, and so does, he's an actor, he calls himself El Hibaro Morivivi. But I love this picture. That's him also. I used this one from the column, because this one had everything I needed. But I also like this one of, you can just almost hear it, si no me dan de beber lloro, you know? <laughs> You know, one of the things I'm able to do in my job is go to places that mean something. This is where I went to grammar school. This was the final day of my grammar school. It got closed down in 2011. And Jim Estrin was photographing it, but I had my camera too, because I went there and I wanted to photograph it. And this was the principal at the time, Sister Nora. She was on the other side of the church. This girl in front of me started sobbing because it was the last day. The school was being closed forever. She was going to go somewhere else. And Nora just slowly worked her way around, sat down next to her, put her arm around her, and slowly knelt with her, and they prayed together. I thought that was really powerful. And this is Nora saying goodbye like, to the last kindergartner who was graduating that day. They do kindergarten graduations too. And then some of the people, like some of the, you know, the figures in our community. This is Mike Robles. If you ever watched local comedy jam or comedy rumba, that was his thing. I mean, he was bigger than George Lopez. George, Lo he would have George Lopez on his show back in the day, but he's still active. Just, I talked before about whatever camera you have. I, this was an iPhone. I was stopped at a light. I saw this happening. I just like took the iPhone. <laughs> quick and kept moving. This is, again, our people with our flag in Times Square. This is a protest for Oscar Lopez Rivera, a Puerto Rican political prisoner who has been pardoned and will be released. Again, our cultural figures, Tato Laviera, the great Near Rican poet. This is after he got a new apartment in Taino Towers. That's his sister. She was uh, Celia Cruz's hairdresser, actually. And she takes care of Celia's mausoleum at Woodlawn. So they, they change pictures and stuff there every now and then. Ramon Jimenez, this, this radical lawyer in the South Bronx who passed away last year. Papoleto, the New Rican poet. This is a thing, I, I'd done an interview, he was about to lose his house, and I, I did a photograph of him in his apartment, and it looked like an old guy's apartment. It was a mess, it was a wreck. And then he starts reading poetry, and he becomes somebody else. I'd already put it on my camera, so I just reached into my bag, grabbed the first one I could, and just leaned back and popped like 10 frames, and I got him reading. And that's the one I use, actually, because he, became, he totally transformed. When he was at his desk, he was an old guy about to lose his apartment. When he started reading, he became something totally different. That's Manny Vega, who does these great mosaic, 106th on Lex is a Julia de Burgos mosaic. 105th, there's all these different mosaics on the side of a building that he's done. He was working on one uh, of Antonia Pantoja, a great Puerto Rican activist of the 60s and 70s. 
She founded a whole bunch of institutions. She's major in the community. She doesn't get her due. But Manny takes pieces of tile with just a, I mean, it's like, it's, it's insanely difficult. It's all manual labor. Just break off tile and glue it. That's what he does. Martin Espada, a Pulitzer finalist in poetry. You know, he's a difficult guy to photograph. And also his father was Frank Espada, who was a mentor to some of us, a great photographer in, in the Bajio back in the day. This guy, Eddie Delgado, this block was cleared off for slum clearance back in the 60s in the Lower East Side, Seward Park, Urban Renewal Area. And they basically cleared out all the Puerto Ricans. Um, they announced they were going to do development of mixed housing. And by this time, Homeboy was 63. So I, I took him back to his old block and photographed him there to talk about you know, how we went from being 13 to 63. 50 years passed and nothing happened until they decided to build luxury housing. This is my picture. This is the one. I saved it for the end. Listen, this picture tells me a lot of things. One, always go to your negatives every now and then. You don't know what's in there, because I sure as hell did. I mean, 30 years this thing sat in my files. I didn't look at it. I didn't know it existed. I had other pictures from that day on my wall. I don't know that this existed until I scanned my negs. I'm like, oh, what's this? And this speaks to me a lot, because, I mean, this is the South Bronx. August 1979, we're burning, city doesn't care, nobody cares. It's like, you're on your own. This is the end of it's going to be gentrified now, of course. Um, I was at a block party. There were tons of people behind me, lots and lots and lots of people. But I turn, I see this couple in their own little world dancing. So I just, you know, took my camera, popped off two frames, just two. This was the one usable frame. And people really responded to it. And for me, it, 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 it speaks to me because, I mean, apart, I mean, it shows you how we dressed in those days. It's a block party. They were dressed to the nines still. The way he holds her, the way they move together. And it's the South Bronx at a time when nobody cared. Nobody cared. But for me, what this shows me is, as I learned as a, a three-year-old, listening to my father play music, was that you know when times get rough, your culture sustains you. you know, your traditions sustain you. This is not some abstract thing we're talking about in anthropology class. This is like daily life in neighborhoods that get overlooked, that neighborhoods that get branded as the residents being less than or not being worthy of or needing to be uplifted by outsiders, well intended though may be. We have within ourselves the strength to move forward if we recognize it. I hope that sometimes my photography accomplishes that. And in my case, it's my photography and my writing together. I kind of blend it all together. But I mean, for me, this is, you know, this image speaks to a lot of people, and it speaks to me because it's just like, it, it's very clear for me what this means. You know, we, we were written off. Nobody cared about us back then. They didn't. Um, but we cared for each other. And that is something that always gets overlooked when they tell the story of the South Bronx. It's like, we're just a bunch of pawns that the city didn't care about. But no, we cared about each other. I mean, I could talk to the fellows in my collective, but we all have our stories about that. You know, Conzo talks about, you know, somebody didn't have food. Yeah. Come on, sit down, have dinner with us. You know, somebody's in trouble, how can we help them? You know, it's not all about, you know, people hiding out and worrying about crime. Yeah, there was that stuff too. But, you know, there was much, something more important, which was community. Because it's a very intangible thing, it's very delicate and very difficult to reproduce sometimes. But for me, this is all summed up in this one picture. Um, I'd like to open up for questions, because these are the last of the pictures. Uh, David, I just wanted to ask you a question regarding the work of Stephen Chains and Teresa Nade. What are your feelings about them? My mother said you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Well, I'd just like to know your, your point of view about it because I tend to disagree with that. I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want, because uh, my, I guess my question to you is since you very, have very stronger ties than most people to the community, I find kind of facetious the fact that some things were sort of staged in some, some people's work. You know, like the demonizing of the prostitution and drug addiction continuing up to like 2012 in the Bronx by Chris and Ale, and I find that, you know, I was very upset by the work, and it even got featured in the New York Times, so that's what I'm Not by me. Okay. Not by me. Okay. Um, 
listen, I mean, I don't want to get into a pissing match with anybody, and I've consistently taken a position that I, I make no public comment on. I will say this. I know Hunts Point. I was born on the other side of the Bruckner. Had family on Beck Street and, and, and Longwood until the mid-70s. I got a cousin who works on Monida Street, and no, she's not a prostitute. You know, she works at a mental health clinic. She's a receptionist. Um, I know tax crew there. I got friends there. I go there to hang out. I mean, you know, last, last Labor Day, I was free. I called up my boy Eddie Pagan. Let's go to Barreto Point Park out in Hunts Point. We just sat down, enjoyed the sun, and took some pictures and talked. It's Hunts Point. I didn't see a goddamn hooker or junkie the whole time I was there. The neighborhood in the 90s was like that. The neighborhood in the 90s was like something out of Dante's <clears throat> Inferno. It was nuts. Are you going to have prostitution there? Yes. You have all these truck drivers going through there via the produce market. But that neighborhood has changed drastically since that period. And I think anybody who just focuses on dysfunction is missing the bigger picture. I do know that there are plenty of women in that community um, who have been highly offended by his portrayal of women. And I can't argue with that. Um, I think it's, it, 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 it's not an accurate representation. And I know that he may not want to hear that. But for me, it's like, this isn't an assignment. This is a place that's in my heart. This is a place I know in my bones. And I can spot bullshit when I see it. Stephen Shames, he's done some great work. Bronx Boys, I can pass. I mean, it's like, it wasn't filmed, it, that wasn't photographed in the South Bronx. I mean, that was like Central Bronx and up by Bedford. You know, but it was difficult to find any mention of the actual locality because I think people want to think, we talk about the Bronx, it must be the South Bronx, it must be a certain type of the South Bronx. I'm not saying you don't do those stories, but you do them with context. And I think some of these don't. And that's the danger, that, you know, people come in looking for a certain thing. And again, People equate black and brown dysfunction with serious, hard-hitting journalism. And that has got to stop. If that's all we get depicted as, then I don't want it. I'd rather we not be depicted at all. If that's all you're going to give us. I'm not saying forget about that. Those things exist. But when you distort it, that's when you get into a problem. Well, you know, let's face it. I mean, he used to be, I believe, he worked in finance. One could argue that there's probably more prostitution and drug use among those crowds. But good luck trying to get into a hotel to photograph that. But at Hunts Point, there's nothing between you and somebody's dignity you just photograph on the street. And that's incumbent on the photographer to realize that and wonder, is this the right thing to do? I think it would be interesting if he went and photographed you know, people in finance getting high and hiring prostitutes personally. I'd like to see that. I mean, you know, Alexander's was like always there. And I mean, that's where we went to get back to school clothes. I mean, that's why we used to buy records at sometimes. Um, I had friends who worked there when we were in high school and college. I mean, people could get jobs there. Um, it was a major thing for the neighborhood. It, you know, now it's like a combination of like just a bunch of you know, children's place and PC Richards and some government offices actually. Um, I think, you know, all these places, though, have taken hits. You know, the hub down on 149th. Tremont never recovered after the 77 blackout, but Tremont was like a major shopping district, but it got looted to hell in 77 after the blackout, and the, and the city never quite put the resources in there to bring it back as a retail district. And then you just had the rise of the malls, and so people would just go elsewhere. Um, I mean, it's still pretty active, but it's not. I mean, when I was a kid, it was a very different type of... Fordham was, a, Fordham was fancy when I was a kid. <laughs> I mean, that was, you know, it was just a fancy joint. I mean, you had, you know, you had several bookstores on the concourse. Um, but, you know, everything changes. I mean, you know, it's, that's, that's part of the beauty of the city. I'm not, I'm not sitting here, you know, lamenting that Alexander's closed. But I have fond memories of going there, you know. But it's just, you know, that's just how it is. Things move on. I think part of it is recognizing what I felt growing up. You know, I mean, part of it stems from 
coming up in an era that wasn't fun in some ways. I mean, it was rough. You know, I mean, memories of fires in my building when I was 11 years old, that's kind of scary. Um, some of the other things we saw, the buildings falling up around you, people moving away. So, you know, you'd say goodbye to somebody in seventh grade, you show up at eighth grade and they're gone, you don't know where they went. I mean, I, 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 a bunch of my friends had just like vanished when one over the summer because everybody was leaving if they could. Um, I think part of it was, you know, just wanting to capture the, what people were going through now in those neighborhoods. Part of it was also my introduction. I was very lucky in some of those neighborhoods. I, I reconnected with people I knew when I was a young man, and they had become organizers, and they showed me some of this stuff, and they, they, they gave me insights into how these things were done. And I found it very powerful. I found it very powerful. Um, I, I started as a photographer. And what I tried to do in my photography when I was young was try to find some way to express an emotion without using words. That it was about an emotional connection. I mean, I could do all this formal crap and, you know, really precise kind of shit, but I want to connect with people. And that's what I do as a writer. I know I do that as a writer. I connect with people. I want, to, I want people to feel something. And so that turns it into a very different dynamic, you know. I don't want, and those of you who know me when I work, um, I don't have the notebook out. I don't have the camera out. I just walk. I see something interesting. Might, if it's not a person, I might take a picture of a building or something. If a person asks me to take their picture, I will. But I, I try to engage them in a conversation. I just talk. And if they see something interesting, if I'm there on an assignment, I mean, it's not just a casual conversation. It starts out casual, but at some point, they say something. And I say, that's important. Do you mind if I write that down? I also identify myself. I don't, I don't front and say I'm just walking through. Now. Um, but I think it's about finding some sort of emotional connection. I'm not really, and I've done big news stories, but I'm not really into doing news as it's defined as breaking news. I define news much more broadly, which is news is something that you don't know. And when it comes to the Bronx or communities of color, there's a lot that readers don't know. <laughs> so I see that. And... What I'm trying to find is not just with any one story, because one story can only tell so much, or any one picture, but over a period of time with a body of work, you get a sense of what this place was like at this point in time. And that includes, for me, though, finding a way to bring the emotional element into the image or into the words. It's as much about feeling as it is about you know, conveying you know, concrete facts. I mean, Franco talks about having depth of feeling in pictures. And, I think, you know, any, any good work that's trying to communicate with people, you know, whether it's music, poetry, photography, writing, whatever, you have to find an emotional connection somehow. And I've been very lucky that every now and then I make that connection. I'm able to think about what it is about that that is powerful and then very carefully draw out from that what I put out there. Because you put in too much, you overwhelm the reader. It, it comes across as mawkish or sentimental. You got to find the right balance to give them that feeling, and then let them figure it out from there. But that's what I try to do. And you know, in, in very tricky situations, I tell people, "You're in control. You don't want a picture, find no picture. You want to talk to me, find. You want to talk to me." I let you know. I I, I learned this a long time ago, where you know I used to you know homeboy and I used to cover homicides in the early '90s. You knock on somebody's door, you know, after their son is shot dead over, you know. A boombox on 121st and 2nd. <laughs> Remember that one? And the woman's ironing her clothes in the projects. And it's like, you know, I'd walk in, I'd say, you don't have to talk to me. I know my editor would be pissed off he heard that. <laughs> but I would say, you don't have to talk to me. I know this is rough. And you know what? They will talk to you. So you respect that. You respect that. But, you know, you, I let them know they're in charge. You know, I'm in charge of the story. But they're in charge of whether or not they're going to talk to me. <laughs> I'm not going to force anybody to talk to me. Well, feelings don't exist in a vacuum. I mean, for me to recognize somebody's feelings means that I have to feel something. And I learned that a long time ago. That that's one of my big, you know, you use all your senses when you report or when you shoot or whatever. And one of your best senses is actually feeling. And the question is, if you look at something or you hear something, and you have an emotional reaction, then it's incumbent upon you to figure out, well, what is it about this that gives me that reaction? What is it? Case in point, 
Um, back in the 90s when kids were dropping like flies because of gun violence, uh, Michelle Agins, a photographer at the paper, and I, um, she had a, a contact at a funeral parlor in bed -Stuy. And she said that when they get a kid, can they call her? And I'll never forget, we were at a, I was hanging out. And I get a phone call, it's a dead kid. So we rushed over to Kings County Morgue and we, we chronicled her from the moment she was pulled out of the fridge in the morgue, okay. Transported to the funeral parlor. We were not there for the embalming. We did not stick around for that, but we came back when they were dressing her, doing her hair, covering up the bullet hole in her face where she'd been shot in the head by some 16 year old knucklehead who she had insulted. The insult was, you won't shoot me. And he shot her. Taraya Starnes is her name. Um, smart kid, you know, wanted to be a psychologist. Really good kid. Um, and I was there when her friend showed up for the viewing. And it's like kids with backpacks and baggy pants, and they're hysterical. I mean, they're just like losing it. And I look at the, 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 the guest log, you know, the little book, the condolence book. And it was all filled with curly letters, the way that kids write, curly letters. And that was the detail that I used. That and a girl sobbing, saying, it's not her, it's not her, it's not her. That's all you need. But the curly kids writing, that knocked me out. That's what got me, it was a page of all those. It was a page of kids mourning a dead friend who shouldn't have died. And you know, when I saw that, I felt something, and that's when I knew that that's the detail I need to use in my story. You know, stuff like that. But you gotta feel it, I mean, we're not, you know, again, we get fooled in the thing, you know, we have to be objective. Objective is, we have to be fair is what we have to be. Objective assumes that we have, that we're automatons, that we have no feelings. And we do have feelings. I'm not saying we, we write biased stuff. I'm not saying that at all. But this whole concept of objectivity, like I started out, is, you know, a construct that might have served the industry when it was, you know, much more monolithic demographically, shall we say, doesn't work anymore. I think so. I still do it. I mean, I do that with my column. Yeah. You know, and also with my just my personal work that I shoot for myself. Um, but I, 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 I find a way of looking at it. Listen, I didn't set out to document the South Bronx when I was a kid. Again, I just wanted to be the Puerto Rican Lee Freelander, so I was on the streets taking pictures. You know, I did not have any grand plan about documentation, representation, or anything like that. Obviously, on some level, I must have had something going on, you know. But I just wanted to take pictures. Um, but as I get older, and I see more, and one of the, I, I didn't show any overseas work, but you know, the work that I did overseas really helped sharpen me in a lot of ways. And when I came back to the States, I had totally different eyes. Well, I started taking pictures more seriously again when I went overseas, first of all. So I kind of picked up after a 16-year hiatus. Because like from 83 to like 99, I took very few pictures. You know, I probably took more SX-70s than I took film pictures, actually. At one point, I was going nuts with SX-70 for a while. Um, but it wasn't until 99 that I started shooting, then I went overseas. So I was getting back, discovering the joy of shooting. But you know, 16 years, I was kind of rusty. You know, and, but I started, you know, I started having much more discipline about it after I got back to New York, and I started going to these neighborhoods again, and I started having the same kind of reactions, except, you know, I have the benefit of some maturity. I know how to deal with people better, in, even in touchy situations, because you just learn to do that the more you do this. Um, and, you know, working with, you know, great people like Angel, you know, you learn things, what to do. Um, and now I'm doing it with a much more conscious decision. Not then. Now I'm doing it with like, you know, I want to show this, I want to preserve this, I want people to know this is how we lived. This is who we are. Now it's a very conscious thing for me. You know, and that's the benefit of all these other things. Working overseas gave me perspective in terms of also, you think you got it bad here? I could take you to some places that, that would curl your hair, you know? <laughs> I mean, that, that, that was good. And even in those places, though, I tried to pursue it a certain way, whether I was working in Haiti or El Salvador, you know, to try to present a reality amid a very tough place. 
But you know, my shooting really got into high gear, I'd say about 10 years ago. That's when I started really just getting obsessive about it again. And it is obsessive. I mean, I, I don't leave the house without some camera. I always have one with me. Um, and if I miss something, I go back. <laughs> you know, it'll come back. Something will come back, you know. And, but I'm also different in the sense that I interact with people more now. I didn't interact a lot. Back then, I did a lot of hip shots. I don't do hip shots anymore. I'm going to photograph somebody. I wouldn't even know I'm photographing them, basically. You know, it's more interesting, too. You, you learn stuff about people, and you learn stuff that informs how you look at the world. Thank you. Thank you. Of it, that what I was trying to do was not be the guy in the corner, you know, corner photo studio, but to do something a little different. And I don't think they, he ever quite got it, to be honest. He passed away about eight months after that in March. Um, but those images of that time and that essay sparked a lot of interest in that. And what happened was the paper asked me to start doing photographs with some of my columns, first online and then in print. And that's eventually how. Um, the City Room uh, blog turned into Side Street, which is what I do now, uh, every other week. And it's basically, you know, a black and white picture with a 750 word column. Um, I've taken two color pictures, and I've done like 80 of them now, maybe, maybe a few more. But I've taken only two color pictures. One was I, was doing, I was doing a piece on graffiti, and I figured that's kind of stupid to have this really beautiful piece in black and white. And then the other one was not that long ago, a piece on these women protesting for Ars Oscar Lopez Rivera, a Puerto Rican political prisoner. And the scene was just so goddamn colorful. I said, I I'd be damned if I'm going to put this in black and white, because <laughs> it, it just popped in color. And so we ran it like that. But primarily, it's in black and white. I shoot it in color, and I desaturate the, the images the technical parts of it. Uh, I'm the kind of photographer. I know enough about what I need to do. I don't get too bogged down in gear. I mean, I have the gear that I, I need to do the job. And, what I do, I don't consider what I do to be photojournalism, to be honest. I mean, I'm a photographer, and I spend a lot of time thinking about photography, and I try to take pictures every day, uh, even if it's just with my phone, which is not a bad little phone camera, actually, on the 7. Um, but I just try to think visually and, and keep my eye active the whole time. Now, as a journalist, you know, having had originally no intention of becoming a journalist, okay, um, I was like a girlfriend suggested I do that when I was kind of at sea. Um, but I was a photographer. So when I got into writing, my, my writing was visual. It was always visual. And the other thing was I, I loved working with photographers at the paper because we collaborate on stuff. You know, I, I have colleagues who like, you know, send in an assignment after they've done the reporting. It's like, you're stupid. The pictures aren't going to jive with the, with the reporting. You're going to miss stuff. And if you really mistreat your photographer, you, the photographer's going to see stuff that he or she is not going to tell you happened. <laughs> so you're going to be out of luck. But I, I was very fortunate to work with some really wonderful photographers, you know, primarily with my, my, like I said, my partner in crime, Angel, but you know, several others that I work closely with. Um, and I think my writing has helped my photography because my writing told me about storytelling and about narrative. And it gets to the point that when I'm thinking about the image for my column now, I'm thinking, does this tell the story? Because sometimes your favorite image is not the one that tells the story. You know, the one that tells the story is the one you got to use. Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to have David Gonzalez as tonight's guest speaker. David was born and raised in the Bronx where he attended Cardinal Hayes High School. He earned a BA from Yale and a master's in journalism from Columbia University. Since arriving at the Times in 1990, he has served as the Times Bronx Bureau Chief, Metro Religion Writer, About New York Columnist, and the Central America Caribbean Bureau, Bureau Chief. Most recently, he wrote uh, the bi-weekly citywide feature column, as well as having published a year-long look at the life of an undocumented family in New York City. Currently, David is co-editor of the New York Times Lens blog and does a bi-weekly side street photo essay feature for the, for the paper's metro section. 
In recent years, he has returned to his photographic roots as a founding member of Los Seis del Sur, a collective of New Rican photographers who documented the South Bronx in the 1980s. Um, David Gonzalez is one of the essential voices that define and bring our city into sharper focus. And we are so honored to have him here tonight. I'm going to sit down a little bit. Actually, maybe I should stand while I, before I start showing the pictures. Thank you very much for showing up tonight. Um, it's good to see some familiar faces here, including uh, my partner in crime, Angel Franco, who's also an alum of SBA, I believe. And, um, and um, we worked on a lot of great stories together. This is before I picked up the camera. He, he had the cameras. And uh, the, the undocumented story that we did that was with Angel, the Pentecostal storefront story that we spent a year with the congregation. Franco was my man on that. And we got into a lot of trouble and a lot of fun while we were doing that. Um, but like Jaime said, I, you know, I, I stumbled back into photography. I, um, I started out, um, I went off to college thinking I was going to be a doctor. And uh, something happened along the way. And I decided I didn't want to be a doctor. Didn't know what I wanted to do. And while I was casting about, uh, my roommate was into photography. And after dinner one day, we went to the dark room, and I was like, oh, it's chemistry. I know chemistry. I'm a science nerd. And so, yeah, it's chemistry. I could do that. And so I, I, I got into it. And I realized that I really liked it a lot, because I found I could say things that I, I really couldn't express with words at all. And I could get at you know, all these complicated feelings in my head. Um, but I drifted back. I drifted back in, uh, when I went overseas for the paper. Because back then, they used to pay uh, foreign correspondents that they used your pictures. And so I said, well, I can take pictures. And I paid for my camera within you know, two months. Um, and I started taking pictures again. But it was really hard. You know, it's two different parts of the brain. And so you're recording, and you're taking down notes. And then you put down that, and you pick up the camera. And in some countries, you say, I'm going to take pictures. And then everybody just stands like this, looking at you. I got lots of pictures in all of Central America of people just standing like this. Um, so that was a challenge. But what happened was, you know, slowly I started getting back into my, into my photography through that. And the really big moment for me, the, the, the shift for me, was in 2009 when I got a scanner and I hauled out all my old negatives and I started scanning stuff. And that was really instructive. It was like a time machine. Um, Emotionally, I felt like I was back in the moment, at least those that I could remember. I was a little wild back in those days. Um, but I started seeing things. And the, the benefit of looking at old work when you have some experience is that you look at it with very different eyes. And like the stuff that you liked when you were a kid, you, you say, I must have been high <laughs> to like that because that don't look good. And then the stuff that you, oh, you pass by, you're like, damn, I, why didn't you see this picture before? And there's one, the picture that I'm best known for is, is one of those, where it stayed in a you know, contact sheet for 30 years, unseen by me, until I scanned it. And what happened was I started scanning, and then my editor at the time, Joe Sexton, suggested I do a cover story for the Metropolitan section uh, based around these black and white images of the South Bronx, primarily. And I wrote an essay for it. Now, I've worked on a lot of really big projects at the paper, some really high-profile stuff. Nothing that I did at the paper in my entire career equaled the reaction I got to those photographs in that essay. About, and it was basically about how I graduated, I went off to Yale to become a doctor, and instead I came back as a long-haired photographer. Uh, being that I was one of the few people in my family to ever go to college, my folks were mortified by, by the fact, my, I think they would rather I have been a musician. My father was an amateur musician, so he was cool with that. But a photo I mean, you know, listen, the communities that we came from, the photog as Franco knows, the photographer is the guy that takes communion pictures. You know, it's the guy that, you know, you go there and, you know, you kneel down and go like this and you have Jesus hovering over you in the background and, you know, you look like an innocent uncle. That's what they thought was photography. And about maybe eight months before my father died, I actually sat down with him and pu pulled out the books that influenced me. And so I pulled out the Walker Evans, I pulled out the Friedlander, I pulled out the Winogrand, and I said, this is photography. This is what I want to do, said he, who <laughs> had very little experience. But I think my father got an inkling that, and you know, my work in at that period was divided between photographs that I took just walking around the streets in New Haven, um, a lot of radical political stuff with uh, the Puerto Rican student group, Despelta Boricua de Primero Julio, and um, and then when I come back to the Bronx, I just take pictures of the neighborhood, 
where we lived or wherever I went. And um, I did that very seriously. And even though I got a degree in psychology, um, I did study some photography at Yale, took a couple of essential courses, and I also met one of my early mentors, Juan Fuentes, who ran a newspaper in Hartford called El Observador. It was a Puerto Rican community newspaper. And I was primarily a self-taught photographer in those days, and as much as I knew chemistry, I didn't know photography. <laughs> um, and so I taught myself a lot of really bad habits. And, and Juan Fuentes was the first person to look at my portfolio, such as it was, and do two things. say. You're onto something, why don't you work with me? And two, you gotta learn technique. <laughs> you have to learn technique. So this crazy Quixote of a man you know, had me go to his house in Hartford for a week and just, you know, like boot camp in the dark room, left and right, printing and reprinting and reprinting and, and talking about stuff. And one of the biggest lessons I learned from Juan actually had nothing to do with film or paper or the dark room. We were leaving the dark room, which was at the, the San Juan Center on Park Street in Hartford, if you know it, and um, <laughs> the cops were hassling, these two cops were hassling a guy in the lot next to the, the center, and so Juan looks at them, looks at me, and says, here, take, take the camera, take pictures, so he gives me one of his Nikon Fs, and I'm like, but hold on, Mark, there's no film, says, take pictures, Juan, there's no, there's coño, chico, take pictures, so I take the camera up, empty, no film, take pictures, and the cops leave the guy alone, I thought, oh, that's interesting, <laughs> you know, is there a cause and effect there? But that, that was a very interesting revelation for me, was the power that this that you're watching, that you're taking notes, as Mike Weiner says. Um, and with the camera, it really appealed to me. So I, you know, I, I left Yale and went to work at a small community arts group called Enfocal, which then was a Latino photographer's group. And uh, you know, did everything we had to do. You know, exhibits on the street, exhibits in banks, libraries, uh, Exhibits at a Museo del Barrio, back when a Museo del Barrio actually showed social documentary photography. I'm talking about you know the early 80s at this point. Um, and I also had 24-hour access to a professional darkroom, which is really the reason I took this job. They paid $110 a week, because I lived three blocks away and had access to a full darkroom, which was really good. Um, and then things happened at home, and I had to get a real job, so I kind of forgot about photography in the early 80s. Uh, your favorite image, you might be able to use it in some other context. But it makes you think critically. And I think having experience in both, in, in, in visual and in written, I think both complement each other and, and they strengthen me in different ways. Um, looking at photography and, and, and journalism and what I do, um, I mean, a lot of us were educated to, as journalists to think of this concept of objectivity is a very real standard, supposedly. Uh, when in fact, I mean, what, what a lot of us were trained of, trained in classically as objectivity was the, per, the point of view of a white male upper class Ivy League educated editor, often. <laughs> and that is seen as the default position, uh, which means a lot of other stuff, if that's the default position, you can imagine how other things get, get shifted around. And, you know, the other thing that got me growing up in the South Bronx, when it was burning, when there were gangs, um, and no, I didn't see drugs in my neighborhood when I was a kid. We saw the neighborhood junkie, that was about it, or people sniffing glue. Uh, we didn't have guns in our neighborhood. We had a lot of poor people. We had a lot of fires in our neighborhood. We had a lot of abandoned buildings. We had people eating government cheese. <laughs> but, you know, we also had a full life, a full community. And I think people forget that. Um, and my profession has been guilty, I think, of, of equating black and brown dysfunction with serious journalism that you know, when we're talking of communities of color and we're talking about photography, you know, we're gonna show people broke down, we're gonna show them vulnerable. I'm not saying we don't have to, but you know, and I'm not gonna get into naming names. Some of you know me know the people I'm talking about. There's a problem with that because it basically fetishizes poverty and continues to treat us as people who are incapable or unworthy of telling our own stories. And I don't buy that. I do not buy that. Now, granted, you're talking to somebody who's a senior writer of the New York Times with you know, Ivy League degrees and all this other stuff, but I don't buy it. I think it's, it, it's, a, it's a specious argument because the fact is we're all shaped by our experiences. Everything that shapes us, we bring it to the table, whether we're aware of it or not. Ideally, we're aware of it so we can check ourselves when we're doing stories and saying, is this the right thing or am I falling onto some preconceived notions? Um, but you know, you have to be alert about these things. And 
again, it's a question of what I see. And I started doing this as a photographer. So, you know, everybody talks about you know, giving agency to people. You know, it's a fancy way of just saying, you know, meeting people where they're at and, and displaying the reality of their lives. Because um, if not, we exoticize people. Um, I saw, I was at the Nat Geo seminar a couple of years ago. And uh, Lauren Greenfield Sanders showed work in progress. And she's been doing